well, thanks for joining us um, for this April edition of the Journal Club. And tonight we're uh, talking about Holcomb Astronomy. The two papers that we looked at was Todd Bostwick's Exploring the Frontier of Holcomb Astronomy, Tracking Seasons and Orienting Ritual Space in the Sonoran Desert. And that was from the um, SCAAS Conference of 2000. Nine, I believe, yeah, 2009, published in Archaeoastronomy, and an older paper of, of Mixon and White, Skywatchers of the Salt River Valley. Oh, uh, they're great papers. I hope uh, hope you guys read them and enjoyed them. And the way I've, I've structured, at least talking about them, is um, kind of, instead of dealing with one and then turning to the other one, kind of using... Bostwick's paper as an outline and just inserting Mixon and White when, when relevant. So the first thing uh, I want to talk about a little bit is the Oodam ethnoastronomy, uh, the descendants of the Hohokam, and uh, talk a little bit about their, their um, current astronomical beliefs and how, you know, what might be able to be extrapolated into the past when uh, talking about the Hohokam. A couple points that are made is that the sun, the moon, and the stars are living beings. There was a talk in the paper about some important cosmogonic figures, including the Earth Doctor, the Elder Brother, Coyote, Buzzard, Sinking Magician, and Southern Magician. Now, where the Earth Doctor is a creator being, a Coyote, of course, is the trickster who, who just throws the stars in the sky in a random pattern in uh, Native American stories throughout the Southwest. Elder Brother um, was born of the sun and the moon, and he's equated with Venus. He's also uh, associated with the uh, man in the moon, man in the maze um, iconography that's shown at the bottom of the page. And then uh, there was uh, he discussed how uh, the solstitial rising and setting points for uh, the summer solstice, the sunrise and the sunset positions on the house on the horizon, were referred to the house of the sinking magician. And the uh, winter solstice correlates the rising and the setting position were known both collectively as the house of the South Magician. And then along the horizon, in between those two, there were houses of four other shaman. So similar to other Northern and Mesoamerican cultures, uh, the Hohokam, or the, I'm sorry, the Oodam, organized their ritual space to six sacred um, cardinal directions. That would be North, South, East, and West, and then up or Zenith, down, uh, also known as the Nader. Um, other religious concepts that might have come from Northern Mesoamerica include a death and rebirth ideology, sympathetic magic um, in the ball game, and some iconography in, in particular, the uh, four-pointed star representing Venus, which is very similar to uh, the Lamat myoglyph, which uh, means star or our uh, great star. And this is, like I said, associated with the elder brother um, who was uh, reportedly to live in the South Mountains. So uh, Bostock also talks about the calendar for the, uh, the Sonoran Desert. This is a, a modified calendar from his paper. With some of the other information filled in. For the summer solstice, um, and then in uh, in July, the third night after the new moon, they had the prayer stick festival, which also corresponded to the to the New Year celebration. Um, Pleiades rise in the summertime was a sim uh, symbolic time to plant crops. The uh, rise of the Pleiades in the fall was uh, corresponded with the wine festival. And the harvest ceremony 
the time to uh, harvest agave and other crops. And then winter solstice, of course, the day of uh, storytelling for four days and, uh, and sacred celebration. And then here, here are a couple maps just to talk about, just to uh, highlight the Hohokam culture area. Uh, the one on the left I picked up off online, it shows the Hohokam core cultural area in the, in the darker pink, I guess, uh, centered around the Phoenix uh, Tempe area. And uh, then in the lighter pink, the Hohokam maximum expansion area. Bostwick has a, a line in there that says, uh, I thought it interesting, Hohokam sites in the Tucson area, including Tumamak Hill and Picture Rocks have archaeoastronomy potential, but little has been published thus far. Um, kind of just giving a taste that there might be more out there that <clears throat> might be uh, available to researchers, you know, if they want to break new ground south of uh, this core cultural area. So the paper focuses on particularly, well, Boswick's on, on three Hohokam villages. That would be Snake Town, which is down here around this area. Pueblo Grande, which is a, a nice little restored museum area, um, downtown Phoenix, and Casa Grande down here the south. And then away from the villages, they're um, talked about several rock art or sun, sun shrine sites on the periphery surrounding the sacred mountains. That would be the Spiral Man site and the Shaw Butte hilltop both up here. Hole in the rock nearby. Um, uh, Hayden Butte, which is over here by the Tempe Butte, and the South Mountain sites. So, Boston talked a little bit about Hohokam village planning, where the villages and the ball courts were uh, intentionally oriented from at least around 800 to 14 AD, which is the classic period. Platform mounds were typically and generally oriented to the cardinal directions with an east of north or a west of north skew. And the, this was likely oriented towards the uh, using the sun to, to set out and, and plan the orientation of, of the villages. Important cosmological concepts from building them, like the uh, four corners of the earth being defined by the solstice sunrise and sunset positions, which of course were also the, the house of sinking magician and southern magician. And then the village central plaza represented the, the center of these four points or, or the up, um, often referred to as axis mundi. Does uh, anybody have anything they would like to Add at that point, or any thoughts? <clears throat> if not, I can keep going. Uh, the first village talked about really was Snake Town, which is uh, further in the south, south of Phoenix. Snake Town was oriented around a central plaza, ringed by uh, eight platform mounds, which were kind of divided into two groups, four in the, in the top, four in the south, um, very similar to like um, moieties or um, the way uh, sites were divided in, in South America. Each one had a ball court. And then uh, he talked about how mound 16 was encircled by 52 posts. And uh, it talked about astronomical significance that might be uh, related to the post and some of, some of these orientations. The most uh, interesting thing I thought about his 
uh, discussion of Snake Town was that from the central plaza, the winter solstice sun rose from behind the twin peaks of Gila Butte and then set behind the top of Pima Butte in the southwest. And uh, talked about how that might have been the reason why the site was chosen or the location of the site was chosen due to its uh, view of the winter solstice sunrise and sunset. And then he also talked about Pueblo Grande. Like I said, Pueblo Grande, as you can see in the, the one picture is, is a, a museum downtown that you can actually go in and walk through, um, walk through part of the reconstructed walls. Um, the site displayed a north-south orientation. At the southern end, there was a, a large platform mound. And at the northern end, there's a, a large adobe house. There's also a ball court at the northern part, which is a uh, seven degrees east of north orientation. So what, what's shown here in this picture is a, a structure, a late construction phase structure built on top of the southeastern corner, which uh, has this interesting um, <clears throat> corner doorway here. And as you can see in the artist rendition, the, uh, it's oriented such that on the summer solstice sunrise, the morning it would shine a beam of light into uh, in, in through the one door, and the beam of light would exit through the through the other door. This would only occur at the summer solstice sunrise. There's a similar structure at a at a similar park, just 12 miles um, east of Pueblo Grande called Mesa Grande. And there's a structure there that has the same kind of um, alignment, except it's uh, directed towards the winter solstice sunrise instead of the summer. Any uh, anybody has anybody ever been there or visited? I know Chris, you were probably. That's probably your backyard, right? Uh, there, was, there was a workshop. Um, one of the early workshops of the society was there. Um, or we participated in it. So we, we got to see this. Um, and it's you can tell here it's been you know capped and it's it's definitely a, a preserved excavation. Um, right. And uh, unfortunately you can't you can kind of see this, but you can't get into it. So it's hard to it's hard to visualize that. Yeah, I, I did have a question on Snake Town with the um, sure Mound Sixteen with the posts. It wasn't clear to me where you know where would you. I could imagine how it would work, but he just notes that the posts were there in a possible alignment, but it, but it wasn't clear how that worked, or if he even explained that. Yeah, I think what he was getting at, and I I can't be sure. But I think he was probably drawing similarities to wood henches, uh, like Cahokia and Fort Ancient and uh, Poverty Point. And even, even as far east as maybe the Susquehannocks, where, you know, potentially they, they built these wooden circles. And some of the posts may have had astronomical alignments from the center if you stood at the center. So that, that was my question. So it is, that would be the assumption is you would be at the center? Um, at traditional wood, hand, uh, wood circles, that would be the case. I'm not sure what he was getting at here at, at Snake Town. I haven't really heard of wood circles that far west into the Four Corners region. They very well may. You know, just because I'm not aware of it doesn't mean it isn't. Okay. I was um, I was at Cahokia two weeks ago, oh, and the nice. and the the model of the wood hinge, the the point of observation is offset from the center about five meters or so mm. to the east, to, at least in that uh, particular makeup. Even though in you know, it's another one of those situations where scholars are 
uh, still very dubious about the astronomical alignment of wood hinges. Yeah. So, yeah. That, that's still there were actually five of them, right, in that one spot. Yeah, there's five. There was reported five uh, at Cahokia, but they actually have, uh, I guess, the main one to the east of uh, Monk, or excuse me, to the west of Monk's Mound. They actually have post, uh, mm -hmm. plus the center post for for alignment there. So they still, you know, they have still have a big placard just explaining the operation of it. So whether it's whether it actually has astronomical alignment or not, it's one of those going to be, uh, you know, an urban myth that everybody's going to read that, that it does, and everybody's going to leave that site believing the wood hinges were intentional uh, astronomical observatories, so. Yeah. Um, Timothy Pocketot, I don't know if you've read any of his work. Well, I have he, his book. I've been working on it, Yeah. Right, right. The archaeology of the cosmos. And uh, is that the one you're talking about? No, I've got the I've got his book, and it's actually uh, I don't know if you can see this. It's uh, actually the uh, about a 2009 oh. edition of Cahokia by Pocket. And unfortunately, oh, okay. unfortunately, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, he goes into he has a whole chapter on supernova. And goes deep into the right, right. Lockhart deal of this uh, 1054 supernova. I haven't gotten into the wood hinge stuff yet, but you know, so this is this is probably one that might be a little bit newer. Um, I wouldn't say newer, but more less geared to the general public. Right. Uh -huh. This is this is um, Timothy Pocketot. Pocketot. Yeah, I don't know how to say it. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's a it's it's a different from from the author that you were talking about. Pocketot deals with a lot of uh, building alignments and a lot of um, landscape on a on a bigger scale. Right. Oh yeah. He gets no, a lot of his archaeostro. I mean, he's he's a top archaeologist at Cahokia, but he gets a lot of his archaeoastronomy from William F. Romaine. And, uh, I don't know if you're uh, familiar with Bill's work there. No, who was that? Because you kind of it was muddled. I didn't hear exactly William what you said. William Romain. Romain. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I'm not. If he's he's done a lot of work in the Cahokia area and um, and the Hopewell area. Right. He's actually a PhD PhD student under Clive Ruggles, and so a lot of that you know he's worked with. Pocketot and Pocketot has some great, uh, great theories. I've I just uh, heard him talk again last Saturday, where he has he has uh, um, built upon some of the theories in in his archaeoastronomy or archaeology of the cosmos, where he's introduced some of the things that I'm really interested in, which is stone temples and the relationship to a wind rain god. Um, something that's come up from um, Mesoamerica, you know, specifically Central Mexico and, and the Maya region, where they were dedicated to Quetzalcoatl and Kukulkan, respectively, and, and had Venus associations. And, and he's found some of the stuff of the Cahokia area, which uh, it's really good stuff. I mean, he does, he does propose alignments to a, minor lunar standstills which i'm very very dubious of i don't think anybody would ever detect that minor or major yeah <laughs> look at open that can of worms yeah major, major you know there's arguments for i guess i i don't think there's any valid arguments for minor lunar standstills well this so, you, but this is this is timothy r uh, Pak Katat, I guess. Yes, I guess yeah. it's the same guy. Oh, did he do the other Cahokia book? Yeah, P A U K E T A T. Uh, maybe I don't have that one. Yeah, but it, I think it's the same. The same guy you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, it could be, could be. This one is a little bit more. Um, 
a little more archaeoastronomy built into it. it, it right. Has a much more of a cornerstone to build his arguments. It's it's worth checking out. It's a it's a it's a good book. I yeah, I'll look for it. Book. Yeah. What's the exact title of the book? The exact title of the book is an archaeo an archaeology of the cosmos. Rethinking agency and religion in ancient America. Uh, and he talks a lot about the concept of bundling, um, uh, medicine bundles, but in particular, that concept of bundling not just contents of a medicine bundle, but taking the bundling concept and, and just uh, expanding upon it, how orientation would be bundled with. Hmm. with um, history and, and artifacts and things like that to, to make bigger statements about how people thought about religion and how religion would have changed, particularly in, in this area. <clears throat> and it, it's, a, it's a good book. Going but, back to Chris's uh, question, yeah, most of the, I, I guess the circle, stone circles uh, in Europe are generally the point of observation is the center of the of the stone circle okay is, is where, where they're typically uh, viewed from um except for i mm -hmm. guess the i don't know if you're familiar with the recumbent stone circles up uh, in oh, yeah. scotland so those are those are generally they've got a you know like a bench stone set in the southwest to observe i guess the uh, sunrise of the summer solstice so Okay. Uh, actually, the recumbent like stones. didn't note anything in the center here, though. So I mean, it's right. I just yeah. assumed they'd be in the center. But well, yeah, I don't know if they, you know, maybe, you know, maybe they haven't done any ground penetrating radar or determined anything there. So yeah. Okay. Is there any reason these ball courts are oriented seven degrees off north? Well, you know, that got me thinking. It got, it got me thinking really to, to last month when we discussed Ivan Sprock's paper about how um, Mesoamerican buildings are have that offset. And mm -hmm. Avini was the one who really coined it and, and you know, talked about the... Um, the class of Mesoamerican architecture that had an offset of, you know, he, he was talking about like 15 to 17 degrees and everything is, is certainly skewed south of east in Mesoamerica and, and Sprock in our paper last week talked about how a lot of that might be alignment to the setting sun on the quarter day as opposed to like an equinox. But I, I think maybe, you know, I think something valid would be to actually, you know, survey this and, and consider, you know, think, think outside of what we're normally thinking of, of like Western Equinox and think, well, maybe could, what could a setting sun date be for this and how, and how might that be? How about the Milky Way? possible um one of the you know to to turn the conversation back a little bit to pocket and the uh the orientation of the central plaza in cahokia there's thought that um that central plaza which runs um much further than the the city center aligns with the milky way at, the, at southern point where it's where it's pointing you know almost almost uh, directly vertical in the sky. Right. And, and that could be. It could be. Yeah, the vertical Milky Way is very interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of Andean cultures see, you know, the their rivers in in the sky with uh, as representative of a celestial version, you know, in the Milky Way. I don't know. I, I, th those are good points. It's, the Milky Way is something that we don't really look for alignment to, really, I guess maybe because it's so wide at, at places or hard to see, maybe. 
um, certainly in in the Andes and and a Cahokia, they you know they've been proposed, and some recent uh, as of yet unpublished stuff uh, suggests that maybe even Maya E groups might uh, have some kind of point on their east west platform to the to the Milky Way. That, that has yet to be determined, I think. Should we move on from Snake Town? Yes, please. We talk, yeah, we talked about Pueblo Grande and, and Mesa Grande. And then the big one, of course, is Casa Grande. And this is why we were hoping Greg would be here, because he did, uh, did some recent or much more recent than what we're talking about here, resurveying. So from what we have here, the big four-story adobe big house, Casa Grande, also called Divan Vaki, I believe, the house of the priest, the largest structure that we know of was built by the whole town. Legend said it was built by a chief called the Bitter Man, who reportedly observed the sun through holes in the house. Uh, the first survey that I'm aware of, I believe, was by Malloy, who was a grad student, and Kayser, uh, a ranger, who used uh, sextants when they were standing on ladders to make their measurements. They looked at uh, two portals and two doorways on the third floor, and nine portals and one doorway on the fourth floor. And Malloy's master thesis that he uh, he then uh, wrote up, proposed that five of the portals and two of the doorways exhibited solar interactions. We were hoping Greg would be here because he later resurveyed that building and he found uh, he does not agree with, with those reportings. So here's a, if you've ever been to Casa Grande, this is one of the visitor placards that they have out. Oops, let me go back up there. So I took a picture of because it kind of you know it got it kind of hit home because they they say it's so so uh, certainly you know they're they're talking about rare lunar alignments of lunar standstills that are you know marked by. The, the square holes and, and the, the round holes, the summer solstice, um, illuminates and, and to the equinoxes. And these ones, I believe, in particular, Greg was saying that didn't work. To the equinoxes? Yeah. So with the uh, So here, here's a little description from uh, Boswick's paper where he talks about how the light from the equinoxes would have come in. And an even more dramatic solar event takes place in the fourth story involving two portals opposite each other in the east and west walls about three meters apart. Less than an hour and a half after sunrise, on a day or two before the spring equinox, the sun sends a beam of light through a portal in the east wall of the fourth, fourth story, forming a circle of light on the inside of the west wall. A circle of light that booms across the west wall until it enters into the portal in the wall, with the light beam then shining from the eastern sunrise through both portals to the west. During fall equinox, the beam of light performs its ritual dance to the upper room a day or two after the equinox. <clears throat> so, you know, Unlike the solstices where, you know, literally need stand still, the sun's position along the horizon is moving pretty rapidly during the equinox time of year. So two days off of the equinoxes is, is actually a pretty big difference than the equinox. You know, as we talked about last week, last month, um, calling it the equinox anyway would have been problematic well i know like in white's paper here he talks about you know the 
east west set rise of the sun at, at 90 and 270 and i'm unfortunately i had to literally walk out the door about 10 minutes before last month but i think the equinoxes have been discussed more or less in a lot of different uh, journal clubs and if you've ever taken a planetary program and just run it one hour at a time the ecliptic in a 24-hour period goes through all 24 stations up and down the horizon you can actually see the ecliptic move up and down the horizon in a full cycle in one day an hour at a time so if the moment of the equinox is not at sunrise and then that six hours down and six hours back is the only time on a given equinox that it's actually going to set at 270 opposite because if the moment of, of the equinox is let's say at 1 a.m then the sun is going to by the time it rises at a particular location is going to has, has moved five or six hours so it's going to uh, that rise set is going to be offset equally uh, on either side of 90 and 270. So there's never, there, there's a very rare time that you have a true 90 degree equal uh, night and day type of thing with the equinoxes. But most people default, and I think white, white defaults to, you know, those are days of equal night and day, which, you know, is not technically true unless you actually had the equinox moment occurring right at sunrise. I'm just saying. Right. And we spent a lot of time last month discussing how uh, or why any any culture other than the Western civilization, which <clears throat> got their you know, traditions from, from the ancient Greeks, why anybody would even come to recognize the concept of equinox. And, and, and Sprock used his term of uh, quarter day as a counted day between the solstices, which uh, is very, very possible for a culture like the Maya, which he was writing about. Um, but I think I think each culture would really need to be uh, approached individually before you can make any blanket statements like that. Well, the one thing about the equinoxes and the quarter days, and I, I find it interesting that Sprock uses quarter versus cross quarter because it seems like in certain circles in archaeoastronomy if, if you use the term cross quarter uh, some of these guys that have been around a long time it sets off a an immediate uh, that's only you know that's eurocentric that's only the only the celtics knew that you know and it's, it's unreasonable to me to think that other cultures couldn't define the, the, the quarter days. Make sure I say it. Pull it in our in our in our somewhat in our wokeness. I'm being a little facetious here, but in our wokeness uh, to say quarter days um, because they they are at, in somewhat more representative of the periods of heat and cooling and spring and fall than the actual solstices are. So. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. So Sprock hey. uses the term quarter days only because he's really only talking about four days, the two solstices and the equinoxes. And then of course cross quarter days refers to eight eight days, right? Because then we have right. Mm -hmm. right. The well, that he was he was actually referring to cross quarter days. No, so he's you're... actually referring to quarter days. Okay, so he's he's he just quartering it up instead of eight. So are you saying okay? Exactly, exactly right. 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 Um, yeah, so. And then I know Brian talked a little bit about cross quarter days in in one of his papers that we we dealt. I think it was December. Right. And yeah, I remember that. He was yeah. Talking about possibly um, solar indications on on rock art of the cross quarter days to uh, signify um, you know ceremonies that actually do happen around that time but but those those ceremonies are 
usually timed by uh, lunar phase observations. So I'm not saying that well, that's uh, not that. I'll just say that, you know, uh, Preston and Preston in their uh, paper on um, solar markers indicated that about 11% of their solar markers occurred on days, 45 days before or after uh, the equinox or before, mm -hmm. or, uh, yeah, or after the solstice or before the equinox which is essentially is saying approximately the cross quarter days. So 11% is not statistically something you can just wipe off as background chatter, I would say. And they are a lot more accurate. And the thing that I've noticed with my research is that the equinox and the cross quarter day solar markers are much more accurate because you can literally tell from one day to the next, the movement of the sun off off of the glyph. Whereas, as we know, the equinox or the solstices, the sun slows down and you get almost probably for seven, at least seven days, you get almost the exact same interaction on solar markers anyway with the solstices. So, yeah. Well, I'm going to hold my thought for a little later. <laughs> All right. Because it'll, it'll come back. But um, returning to Casa Grande, this is um, Wilcox's reported um, all of his reported orientations. And uh, <coughs> right out of the gate, anything like this, I'm usually skeptical of. You know, the one corner to the other corner. Um, Avini suggested some of that kind of stuff at um, Chichen Itza at the Caracol. And uh, I think, I personally think maybe that's a stretch, especially when you're saying it, it's going to uh, minor lunar standstills. But, but there it is. Do we have a picture of that window? Um, I know we were talking about that earlier. <laughs> it's hard to visualize these diagrams. Um, I don't have a good picture of it. Um, you know, here's here's an artist's rendition of it. And uh, what's the word? So would those, those be the vertical windows we saw there in between the two on the side yeah. here? I think I so. Well, the previous discussion really kind of started with the, you know, Greg uh, Munson saying that he didn't think that Equinox windows worked. And if you look at, the, go to your next screen there. Right. See where the, he shows the Equinox shooting through these two things. You know, the chance of that actually occurring uh, goes back to what I was saying is that you would have to have that moment of Equinox at a perfect time for that to actually operate. So Indeed. it probably doesn't. Yeah. But if, if you look even here in this, this text, he even spells out that um, it was two days before the equinox, you know, when they measured it. Right. Sunrise on a day or two before the equinox. And it's a half an hour after sunrise. So right that right there that's pretty much kills it yeah i would like to argue a little bit with that because sure uh, the the um if you count the days uh from solstice to solstice and take an equal number of days each way it doesn't come out on the on the true uh, east west direction correct it does not so yes so what's wrong with it being uh, 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 lining uh, lining up on the day that the ancients thought counted it to, should line up? It would fit their theory rather than ours. I I agree with you one hundred percent. Other than the fact that 
and, and following Sprock in this, that we should not be calling it the equinox then, because the equinox yes. has a very specific definition. Yeah. And that's why he uses the term quarter day as uh, as a as a counting term, almost like um, right. a pseudo temporal. Another term is day count equinox. Yeah, right. or or temporal temporal pseudo equinox. I've heard that as as yeah. as well. Um, well, so, I, so would it would it you know? The, of course, we just I think two two months ago we uh, talked about you know an equinox based on time versus an uh, equinox based on uh, geographic split. I mean, right. could that possibly work on a geographic versus a time split? Because the well, sun isn't moving or we're not moving at a constant speed around the sun. Right. So yeah. maybe, maybe those windows work earlier because of that. Yeah, so exactly. Ruggles talked about four different types of I guess kind of, he didn't use the term pseudo equinox, but that's what he was talking about. And the one was, of course, the the sent the the midpoint in the count of days between solstices, right? Which would be a temporal two equinox or Sprock's quarter day. The right. other one would the other one would be a midpoint on the horizon between the southernmost and northernmost, but. The problem with that is you would need a very, very accurate way to measure angles. And from an ancient's perspective, you know, the question would be, is the juice really worth the squeeze? Because what would that mean to them? I mean, where, where would the contextual meaning lie? And then the third one was, you know, directly rising east and directly setting west. And that's, you know, I would, I would rather, instead of call that, Equinox, I would I would consider that orientation of the cardinal directions, which which we know was very important to uh, to the historic Pueblo people, to to you know pre you know prehistoric people. Uh, it's it's important that all you know the Iron Age, uh, Europe and, and South America, you know the cardinal directions, and getting the cardinal directions right is often very important so that would that would be a totally different thing i think than saying it's oriented to the equinox oriented to the cardinal direction such as pueblo bonito and then of course the last one was equal equal amount of daylight and, and darkness and, and that has its own its own problems when trying to determine without you know actually having a clock or, or some mechanism to tell time so out of all of them i think certainly the the method of, of the count the temporal midpoint of counting days i think that's probably most plausible for sure well Which let me ask you on this on this diagram that that little compass at the bottom mm -hmm. is that is that supposed to be uh giving us a north reading on this a diagram it is. So, so are you, I, maybe I miss it. So, is Casa Grande offset? Yeah. So here, north? here you can see um, the same, same, same drawing he had. It right. Looks like here, compound B and compound C and D all seem to be aligned to the cardinal directions, right? Right. And compound A is the only one that's offset. Right. Hmm. Mm -hmm. It is interesting. That's a, but but yeah. that's the one that has all these alignments that supposedly work, right? Correct. Uh, now, yeah. I don't believe that compound B has actually been studied. But the compound, uh, the big house is compound A is the one that's underneath the, in the picture right here, right? Yeah. yeah. So what, what, is, what is compound B? Is that just a floor? outline it's not actually a building to be studied per se um there's 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 you know from the drawing you can see there's two buildings there they're certainly not on the scale of the big house right and uh, oh, they, they, do they, exist? they may not have weathered the years as well right 
Is the degree of offset the same on seven degrees? No, it looks like it's straight. Those look like uh, they're. I mean, Casa Grande is, is tilted, maybe five you mean, degrees. You mean the, like the same as this ball court? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, at least uh, his diagram suggests that it's offset a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it, it could be. It, it's, it, would be, it would be worth the survey to, to actually get the walls and everything. Yeah, I think probably the 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 mistake with Casa Grande is that you know people went in looking for alignments to the equinox and looking for alignments to minor lunar standstills, and then you know it was celebrated when they when these things were found. You know, no matter how they were found you know what I mean? but i think there's probably some you know like this here this is this seems to align with both the building and the compound these holes so even though you know when they say they don't align to the equinox you know the question is well why would they really But I think the more interesting question is, what are they aligned to? I mean, they obviously, they obviously had their, you know, had their reference point here with the cardinal directions. You know, they knew how to do it because they did it everywhere else, even a clan house. So this is offset for a reason, and it's not the it's not the equinox as we would define the equinox. But I, I think I think it certainly does warrant a, another look, maybe another another survey. And maybe not just, you know, that holes, but maybe the, the entire site and the building and then the holes and, and put the contacts together and maybe see what what was really going on there? Was well, there are there any major horizon features that might have been sacred that may have caused that particular alignment? Uh, maybe. Um, I was just there last summer, and that's where I got these pictures. But I, you know, I didn't take any of the horizon because I wasn't really thinking on those terms at that time. I guess I warrant a trip back. Chris, do you have, uh, is it not uh, Malloy's paper? No, um, Malloy's, Malloy's paper, his his thesis, you know, I, I don't have that. I was never able to get my hands on that. Uh, the reason I ask is, so he, he was a student of Ray White's, mm -hmm. and just from personal communications with him, I know they didn't just survey it. I, mean, I know they made an observation, so one of these... Uh, equinoxes. I remember hearing the story of them sitting up there at sunrise and watching this thing. So um, I just wanted to throw that throw that in there. Hmm. And I know there was a follow up work uh, by Renee Opperman, I believe. I think it was another mm -hmm. student of Ray White's, um, and that's that. I think is an easily accessible paper where there's a little bit more rigor, I think, in in the in the measurements. Okay, thanks. Maybe if you could send me those uh, the, those references, I'd, I'd love to check them out. Or follow up on them. Okay, and I, I've never seen the uh, Malloy paper myself, so I'd love to, because I think that's what started all this, right? <laughs> yeah, it's what started it, but uh, you know, it's just that guy's, you know, it's his his thesis. Yeah. Hey, this is Ron. If uh, if you find those, if you could just post them there, it would be great. We could all take a look at them. Yeah. That yeah. I definitely have, I, I think I have a personal copy of um, Renee's paper. I photocopied it from UC Davis library and the other paper, like I said, I've never seen, so. Yeah, it was never published. But I can scan that and send that along. Yeah, that would be great. 
All right, I'm going to step it up a little bit. So those are the three villages that we've talked about. Then he talks about um, some other sites where Cushing proposed that there should be shrines distributed around Hohokam villages that re represent the six sacred cardinal directions. And here's a couple here on the Phoenix Mountain. Um, this picture I grabbed, I guess Greg took it because it was in our invitation on Facebook. And then um, these are Bostwick's photos where he shows that on midday and the winter solstice, the wedge of light moves across the spiral, which uh, may possibly represent the sun's journey through the sky. And then Shaw Butte. So Shaw Butte is a, a stone uh, circular masonry compound atop Shaw Butte, which is north of Phoenix. The rock stood over a meter high and contained these three rooms and a trail coming up this way and another tr steeper trail coming down here. And then there's a, what he calls here a rock shelter, which is likely a sun shrine. The whole site has uh, nearly 350 petroglyphs, 80% which are geometric designs. 60 of those are circles within a center dot, which some Pueblo cultures say symbolizes the sun and the center dot as the sun's umbilical. Um, several rock art panels inside the compound uh, supposedly align with the solstice and, and the equinox sunrise and sunset. And here's a photo from the top of Shell Butte. And you can see it has that has one of the most interesting uh, horizon, you know, I, I will call them uh, foresights or backsights that foresights that, that you could you could really ask for. So here's a picture of the rock shelter, and this is was taken last last year at the equinox. Uh, the top of it, which you can't really see, is definitely manipulated to create just this um, shaft of light that comes down and then moves across the floor of the rock shelter. And uh, Bostwick talks about how it also moves and where it ends up, you know, on the, on the summer solstice and the winter solstice. In the very center of of Shaw Butte, there's this um, this petroglyph panel which has 13. He counts 13 of these circles with a dot in it. 13 out of the 60 found at the site, and he says he he surmises that perhaps there's represents lunar phases in a solar year, um, based upon I guess the spiral and count of 13. And then this rock here. If you, if you sit back here on this rock, uh, directly aligned with this anthropomorph and the peak of the, of the boulder, uh, lines up exactly with this winter solstice sunrise. And uh, these, these are both, well, well, this is directly in the center. This is just to the east of the compound. And then this is on the, uh, southeastern side. So last year I went and I, I remeasured some of the things that Bostwick was talking about in this paper. Um, if you look here at this panel, this is the one that he talked about was broken off by vandals, where there was an anthropomorph figure and some other things. This, this was a much bigger panel. And I have my arrow over these circle and dots here. So you can't really see them, that, but I have my north arrow there, just just to give the alignment there. And my tripod, which here is pointed back, you know, to these circles and dots, which are right here, and it aligns pretty directly with this other one that's that's hidden. But but these two and this guy um, line up pretty much directly and uh, you know I, I went and I took I took my measurements I 
did my uh, declination calculations. And then the next morning I got up in the, you know, way before the sunrise and went out to the site and was able to get confirmation photographs of, you know, what Bostock was claiming that these two aligned with the sunrise there um, on the equinox. So what does that mean? I have no idea what that means. Kind of goes against everything I've been saying here for the last two months. But there it is. And I'm certainly open to open to opinions. I mean, there's really no ethnographic evidence, of course, for an equinox among the whole common. And we've just we've just been spending the last several minutes discussing why and But, there well, but, did, but didn't they talk about, in one of these papers talked about somebody keeping uh, calendar sticks, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I know, um, you know, there is a, I don't know, I'm not sure how to say it, but the, the Singua, Singua Indians, I guess, north of Phoenix, 30 days uh, after, uh, huh? A Sinagua? Yes, yeah, Nagua, I guess that's how you say it. Yeah. 30 days after the equinox is the start of the uh, agave harvest. So, you know, they had to know when the, the equinox was. Um, and then there's a rock art sun symbol that has two what were called register marks that uh, a geographic shadow sun line line up with those two marks 30 days after the equinox. So in a, in a lot of cases, because, you know, the sun watcher is closely held, we may never know. I think there's probably a reason for them to have done this because, I mean, apparently this is an alignment to the equinox. So it, they had to be thinking something. It's just that we'll probably never know in that particular culture what that, what that meant. Right. Uh, it might have just been an anticipatory like the, uh, agave harvest I just mentioned it, that's that was just an uh, you start counting you start putting notches in your stick 30 days and then you start harvest or yeah start harvesting so we'll probably never know but obviously they went to the trouble of aligning this on this date so so even though we don't have any ethnographic you know information to confirm it but, you know you can't deny the alignment now, the old Don they talked about their agave harvest festival was what three was it three nights after the first new moon in July? Which very much, you know, could line up depending. All right, the next site that, um, Boswick talks about, and then the white and mixed paper focuses on is the hole, hole in the rock site, um, which, which is a park in uh, just north of Phoenix. It has this chamber that, you know, gets a lot of people that they climb up here. And then there's a second chamber behind it, which actually has the hole in its roof, which, which gives the... Uh, uh, gives the site its name. I mean, mix it in white, uh, call it an observatory, which is certainly a misnomer. It would have been more of what uh, Kim would call a sun shrine than a, an observatory, but this is what it looks like from the parking lot. <clears throat> so they talk about on the, uh, the, the spot of light that hit, comes down from the upper hole and it hits the rock wall. It says the, the spot of light first appears uh, at 7.41 a.m. for the summer solstice and 8.45 for the equinox, which is when this paper, this picture was taken, and 9.41 for the winter solstice. And then it starts to make its way downward until it reaches the floor. Um, here it says the positions where the first small spots fall are marked for the summer solstice by bedrock tate containing two cupules. And here you see these cupules um, 
that are actually, you know, pounded into the rock uh, where the, the summer solstice light would hit. Um, this is actually a later in the day picture. But, but here um, on the equinox, here's, here's the pounded cupule that they talk about. And here's actually the, the light as I measured it. And interestingly, it says the spot, the light spot fell 15 centimeters south of the center line of the bedrock Matate, which is used as the equinox marker. It fell two days earlier than the equinox in the spring or two days later than the equinox in the fall. The equinox, the holes in the east wall of Casa Grande uh, are pretty much the same things, right? That we just talked about oh, happened yeah. two days before the spring equinox, two days after. And then he makes the same point. Prehistoric people probably did not understand the equinox in the true astronomical sense. Instead, they may have identified the event with a position on the horizon, which was halfway between the two solstices. I would probably argue a day, which was halfway between the two solstices, instead of a position on the horizon. But then they say this orientation also corresponds to the sunrise point and a notch on the apparent horizon created by the north end of the superstition mountains and the mountains behind them. This notch is known to the Pima as Ga'akud, I guess you would say that, meaning U-shaped and is very special in their tradition. So here they may be offering a solution to why it's two days off from you know, the, when, the Western equinox, because they weren't looking at that at all. They were looking at you know, when the sun hit uh, this this U shape feature on the on the horizon. I would I would argue maybe that that should be looked at closer. Uh, I think maybe the you know, I, I think maybe it should be approached to see if it is a temporal marker and not a uh, an angular marker because. You know, half halfway on the horizon seems much harder for anybody to determine. But uh, uh, what you're saying is that the time marker determines it, and uh, it was a coincidence that it happened in that particular mountain valley. I would I would think so. That would that would be my thought. It's reasonable. Because <clears throat> how would they know that that notch is, you know, perfectly centered between the northernmost rise and the southernmost rise without some kind of, you know, without a theodolite, really. Yeah. <laughs> without di divided circles. Yeah. I mean, I think it would be much easier for them and much more practical for them to to count and then notice, right? Notice that on that day, something was happening as opposed to finding that angle of the direct midpoint and then noticing that the sun, you know, the sun rose there. That, that seems. You'd have to see something laid out on the ground and how they were bisecting the angle. Right. <laughs> between the solstices. Yeah, and, and, and without that being done on a, on a very large scale, um, the accuracy I think would be wanting. But I, I found that interesting. I found, you know, that If this is if this is real, you know, two days after the equinox, why is that even here? <laughs> you know, and who put it there? I don't know. There's there's a lot of things going on here. I, I certainly don't claim to have any of the answers. Maybe just a smidgen of data.
so of course they they proposed lots of different orientations coming out of hole in the rock they talk about how on the equinox the shadow goes across into the boulders and they also talk about uh, sight lines and orientations you know using using the view from hole in the rock to some of the other sites across you know the phoenix valley and then they offer some of their statistical analysis at the end, which uh, you know I'll, I'll skip through. But you know, it's all there in the paper. So the next site that they talk about is Hayden Butte. This one I thought was interesting. Uh, when they talk about panel fourteen, that shows these two guys, which might possibly be interpreted as twins. And they talk about the larger circle is maybe a, a summer solstice sun and the smaller so circle maybe a winter solstice sun because on the summer solstice, the big circle and this twin are illuminated. And on the winter solstice, this twin and the smaller circle are illuminated, are illuminated leading to, you know, the possibility that this may depict a sinking magician and southern magician. It's uh, intriguing, but of course unprovable. And then uh, the last sites are a collection of petroglyph sites on South Mountain. Um, midday summer solstice interaction with a light dagger. This is a proposed equinox interaction, but from everything we've been talking about, maybe the photograph should have been uh, taken two days before the equinox to see what that happens or, or what happens on that day. And then here's just a photograph from Bird Rock, you know, when we did our workshop there in 2017. Um, Boston and Krosek have a, a great catalog of the rock art of South Mountain in this book, Landscapes and the Spirits. If, if you guys don't have that, if it's a, and you're interested in rock art, the whole comment's probably the, the best resource there is. And that's all I had prepared. Um, which says, referencing the first paper, hopefully not a dumb question, but what are some of the dual spatial divisions referred to in the first paragraph of the conclusion? The first paper, meaning uh, Bostons. Pull up the conclusion. Dual spatial divisions and organization of ritual space according to cardinal directions were important components of those ceremonies. So most Native American societies were um, very interested in the sacred directions of north, south, east, west, and then up or nadir, up or zenith and down nadir. But I think what he's talking about there is uh, kind of like we saw at Snake Town, where there was a causeway dividing the north northern part of the town to the southern, and the northern part had four platform mounds and a and a ball court, and the southern had four platform mounds and a ball court. That's that's what I took took that um, reference to mean. I don't know if anybody else has a different interpretation. Well, I'm not hearing anything. Um, usually in a paper, what happens when you get to the conclusion is that it really is something you say, oh, yeah, of course. But that one, I didn't get that conclusion <laughs> in the paper. 
Yeah, I, I see what you mean. Um, and and it also kind of, I, it also made made me think a little bit about like some of the Hopi stuff we've been talking about since December <clears throat> about their strong, you know, their strong concept of duality where where the year was split in half, <clears throat> you know, that every everything had its opposite like. Um, winter solstice was celebrated and at the same time they thought summer solstice was probably celebrated in the underworld <clears throat> so they didn't really have much of a summer solstice celebration yeah. okay well thank you yeah maybe, maybe that's what they were talking about I think uh, with respect to the what you were saying about the conclusion, I think the big difference is there's not a lot of strong ethnographic ties um, that we can reach to uh, back to the whole I mean, We go to Odom people, um, but there's still kind of a, a gap between the whole and and what we have real good ethnographic data on. So sure. we have lots of alignments and that kind of touches on what you were talking about from White's paper with statistics. Um, he does it lightly in here, but that's kind of one of the few tools we have to rely on is sort of set up the null hypothesis and um, do our best to show that, okay, these alignments are real, then you can do a statistical analysis on say whether they're by chance or not, but that's still not a strong ethnographic tie to whether or not somebody actually did that. Right, and the problem with, with Nixon and White's thing is they're, they're running the statistical analysis, but they're really talking about a site which is almost like one of a kind, right? With the, right. With the cupules and the, and the shafts of light filling it like a, like a cup of light. And uh, those kind of sites, you know, like that and Stonehenge and Newgrange, which are really one-offs are, are really the hardest ones to, to address if they don't have correlates. Well, and when you run the statistics, you have to create a model and there's always going to be bias in there. And then, so it's, it's a challenge to do it, but I do think that's something we should all think about is there are those type of methods available to us to, to test the hypothesis. And you, even simple things that you had mentioned, you know, we have the picture of the sun dagger on the glyph, but we should have had a picture before and after to see, you know, how it changes, right? Yeah, and it's interesting, obviously, throughout you know, the Southwest, the, the winter solstice was a really big thing. And both these papers did a, a lot of emphasis on, on the equinox. And, and was that because the evidence was there or was that because that's what the authors, you know, figured was you know, important and things archaeoastronomers should look at. And, and what, you know, and, and from what was found, what does it mean, really? And that's the part that I struggle with. You know, we have possibly this thing where, you know, it's two days before the equinox and, and, and align, an alignment to a horizon marker that seems to seems to agree with that but then you know we have other interactions with rock art that point to a, a, an actual equinox and is that serendipitous or did it mean something it's really really hard to say well, i have to say chris thanks again for putting this together in a digestible way <laughs> i know it's a lot of work um it's my pleasure and I, I will try to get a copy of that, um, those two papers on Casa Grande. Um, I know how hard it is to find papers, so we should, we should share what we have. <laughs> so.